So if you've made it this far, you've got through the main uh, exposition of the story and the rising action of the story. So you always want to treat these stories like they're kind of mini stories, like short stories, not obviously the same as a novel, but definitely longer than the average poem that you would read. So you're doing pretty well. By the end of this session, we're going to be halfway through. So at that point, everything is all established and we know what the main setup of the story is. And it's about how does it resolve? How do we come out of this scenario? So we're up to the point where they resolved in some forest dim to kill Lorenzo and there bury him. So we have this beautiful love set up between Isabel and Lorenzo. And then the antagonists come in, the villains. They want to destroy everything for their own personal gain. So this is the, the kind of really tragic kind of intensity of the poem, I think, happens here. Um, I find it really sad because I'm like, oh, Paul Lorenzo, he's a nice little guy. And he has a lot of bad stuff happen to him. And I think you're meant to feel that. So it's um, if you're studying this in terms of tragedy, there's a word called pathos, which means a mixture of pity and fear. And Aristotle, who wrote um, Poetics, which kind of outlines the rules of traditional Greek tragedy, he always said that we should feel pathos while we're in the center of a tragic story. And by the end, we feel catharsis, which is like a relief of emotion, a purging of emotion. So at the moment, what we're feeling in the story, hopefully, if you like the characters at all, um, you'll be feeling a bit of pathos, which is stress. Like you're worried about Isabella and Lorenzo and how are they going to get past these evil brothers. So you want to think about, as we go through this section, how the pathos is uh, increasing. So on a pleasant morning, because Lorenzo's in love, he's happy, he leans into the sunrise over the balcony of the garden terrace in this beautiful house. And they come, the brothers, they come walking towards him they step on the dewy grass, they destroy the beauty of the landscape, and they say, you seem there in the quiet of content, Lorenzo, and were most, most loath to invade calm speculation. So you seem very quiet and happy. We don't want to destroy your calm. But if you're wise, you should probably get on your horse and you know head out for hunting today while it's still morning and cold. And you know, so you've got a full day's hunting ahead of you. So they disrupt his happy state and they tell him he needs to go hunting. Today we intend, in fact, this hour, I, this hour, even now, we're going to ride, we're going to ride towards the Apennine, 10 miles from Florence. I actually looked that up. <laughs> so they're going to go out towards the Apennine mountains um, and go hunting in the forests there. Come down, come, come join us, we pray you before the hot sun counts his dewy rosary on the eglantine, which is a, a really nice, beautiful image. So um, dew is like the drops of condensation you get in the morning that covers the landscape and it evaporates throughout the day. So the sun, as it gets hotter, kind of um, evaporates all the dew. So you only see that in the really early morning. I'm almost never awake to see it, but it is really beautiful, the idea of dew drops. And it's likened to a rosary, which is um, a Catholic prayer beads. Eglantine is a wild rose bush. So again, symbolic, metaphorical. The whole world for Keats is symbolic and metaphorical. Lorenzo, being polite as he was wont to do, as he was used to doing, because obviously these are his bosses, they're his masters. He can't just say, oh no, it's actually... If you think of it as like, you know, your boss invited you on a hunting trip, it's like a um, something that you should respect and be positive about. So he's used to following orders and he bows to them, even though they're called serpents, they're snakes, they trick him. That's also a biblical allusion to the Garden of Eden. So there's this beautiful garden, Lorenzo's having a nice day and these snakes come in and they kind of trick him and they ruin everything. So he goes in haste, he hurries, gets ready. He puts on hunting gear. So this is quite a good little quote if you want to write some quotes down. Belt and spur and bracing huntsman's dress. It's highly ironic because he's about to be hunted, but they've told him to get dressed as a hunter. So they are going hunting, but they're actually hunting him, which is uh, really 
quite um, intense, <laughs> I think, like quite harsh. Again, increasing that pathos. So as he's passing through the courtyard of the house, he stopped on every third step to see if he could hear Isabella singing her morning prayers. The matin song, matin is French for morning. Or hear the light whisper of her soft footstep. And as he hung that way over his passion, he heard a laugh that was fully musical above him. And he looked up, he saw her bright features smile through an indoor lattice full of delight. Lattice is like a kind of crisscross um, door or screen pattern. So she's full of joy. And he says, my love, Isabel, I was upset in case I missed the opportunity to say good morning to you. What would I ever do if I lost you? I'm so compelled to suppress the heavy sorry I feel from even being three hours away from you. But we can make up for our lost time in the amorous dark, what is lost out of the day. So amorous dark, again, a really nice little quote that encapsulates the fact that nighttime is the friend of these lovers because they can't meet in the day when everyone can see them. They can only meet at night in secret. And so they say goodbye. Goodbye, I'll soon be back. Goodbye, she said. And as he went, she chanted merrily. And that's the last time they see each other. So again, huge increase in pathos because we know that he's about to die. So the two brothers and their murdered man ride out of Florence to the river Arno where it gurgles through um, kind of riverbanks that have been constrained. And it's covered in bulrush, which is kind of reeds. And there's swimming fish that are kind of um, swimming upriver against the flow of the water. The brother's faces in the ford, ford is kind of like a low um, wide bit of river that you can cross. And as they ride their horses through the ford, their faces are reflected in the water and the brother's faces look sick and ill, like pale, one is kind of pale and ill. Lorenzo is full of love. So Lorenzo's happy and he's full of life because he's in love. The brothers are sickly and kind of wrong because they're evil. They don't love anyone. They don't love anything. And they pass into a forest quiet for the slaughter. And there Lorenzo was killed and buried. And that's where his love stopped. And when a soul is freed from the body in this way, by murder, it is ill at peace, it's not um, restful, it's not peaceful. It's kind of like a bloodhound following the scent of an animal, it's seeking out the sin of what happened to it. And the brothers wash their swords in the water and they encourage their horses home and they stick the spurs into the side of the horse, that's the kind of spike on the bottom of their boot each richer by his being a murderer. It's a good um, good line. Yeah, so when, the, when a soul wins its freedom this way by murder, it's ill at peace, it's not happy. And each person, each brother is richer by being a murderer. Both really good quotes from that stanza. I'm really bad at reading the Roman numerals, but this is up to 20, 20 5, 6, 7, 8, 28. Um, if you're trying to keep count in normal numbers. So when they get back, they tell their sister that Lorenzo's just gone. He's taken ship for foreign lands. He's gone off because of some great urgency that was their doing, that they need someone they could trust. Poor girl, narrative interjection from Keats. You poor girl, put your widow's weed on, put your widow's clothes on and escape from the wretched bands of hope. Don't live in hope because you'll never see him again. You won't see him today or tomorrow or the next day. So she weeps alone for the pleasures that she'll never be able to enjoy, uh, enjoy again. She's sore from weeping. Oh, misery. Lots of sadness again. She looks and thinks about it um, alone. And she seems to see his image in the dusk. 
and she kind of moans at the silence, spreading her perfect arms upon the air. On her couch, low murmuring, where, oh where, where is he? So it's very sad, this bit. Obviously, it increase, increases pathos. Um, this is a painting, by the way, that is really nice. It's like um, a William Holman Hunt, who's one of my favorite pre-Raphaelites. The pre-Raphaelites are painters that are obsessed with Keats. So if you if you like Keats, you probably like them. They're all really into sensual imagery and kind of like richness and intense emotion. So they sort of do that visually, whereas obviously Keats does it poetically in words. Um, but they have similar kind of feelings and ideas. So yeah, you can see, I'll just kind of zoom in on her face. She's sad. There's a pot, there's a head in the pot, there's a suggestion of a skull on the pot, and then there's this beautiful flowering, very, very rich basil. Um, so yeah, anyway, sorry, <laughs> just going into that painting for a second. But selfishness, the cousin of love, didn't long hold its vigil in her lonely chest. She worried and waited for the golden hour of dawn to arrive, watching the time with feverish unrest. And in her emotions, she's confused. So she's feverish, she's selfish at first, but then she gets worried and more stressed. Um, she has a throng, a crowd of higher emotions overcome her. So tragic. A rich as this means they're more rich and more um, powerful emotions. Feels tragic. She feels about, uh, she feels passionate that's unbridled and she feels sorry for her love. So it's only briefly that she feels for herself. After that, she feels more worried about him. It's autumn now. It's moved from summer into autumn. In the middle days of autumn, during the evenings, the breath of winter comes from far away and the sick west wind continually knocks the gold tinged leaves off their branches and plays a song of death among the bushes and leaves, making all of them bare before he dares to leave his arctic cavern. So sweet Isabel by gradual decay from beauty fell. So as the weather turns to autumn and it's got a kind of breath of winter in the air, and as everything starts to die back and wither away, Isabella does the same. So she's in harmony with her natural world. It's a sad, um, sad kind of extended metaphor in that stanza. And Lorenzo came not. He doesn't come back and that's why she's like this. She asks her brothers a lot with really pale, scared eyes what must be keeping Lorenzo away from Florence for this long? And they tell her lies. They speak a tale. They make up stories time after time to quiet her. And their crimes come over them like smoke from Hinnom's veil. And every night they have uh, nightmares because they see her um, covered in a shroud, in a, in a dead uh, covering. So they're really frightened, basically, because they think something's going to go wrong, that their plan to just marry her off to some wealthy person so she forgets Lorenzo is not going to work. The reference to smoke from Hinnom's Veil is actually really um, dark. It's, it's a biblical reference, but it's about this uh, place called Hinnom where they sacrificed um, children. And so it's suggesting that Isabella is a kind of um, perhaps suggesting that Isabella is a kind of sacrifice or that the brothers are evil like the people in Hinnom's Vale who thought it was fine to sacrifice uh, youths or children um, for their own ends. So yeah, the idea of um, sacrifice comes in here. There's, as with all Keats poetry, there's a huge conflation, you probably noticed as we go through, of um, pagan imagery, so ancient Greek and Roman myth with Christian imagery. So Keats does that deliberately. He kind of borrows from both. So it's good to kind of be aware of both of those as you go through. So Isabella, the final stanza here. 
um, in this section, she would have died in sleepy ignorance of truth. But something happened to her, a thing more deadly dark than all came like a fierce potion drunk by chance. And then we have some metaphors here. So um, it's the, the feeling or the thing that happens to her is like a fierce potion accidentally drunk. And it saves a sick man from death for a few moments. So it's an interesting simile, that one. This thing saves her from death, but for a few gasping moments. Like a sword waking an Indian from his cloudy walls of heaven with a cruel pierce and bringing him again sense of the gnawing fire of heart and brain. So is this transition between the spiritual afterlife and the, the kind of reality of the living and there's a sense that in the real world it's all suffering and in, in kind of heaven or your afterlife it's peaceful and that state in between which Isabella is now to kind of occupy um, is a state of suffering. She almost dies because she pines too much for Lorenzo and then this thing drags her back to life but only temporarily, only for a few gasping moments. Um, and she's full of intense emotion, again, gnawing fire at heart and brain. So something happens to her and we'll find out what in the next section.